Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Julie Grant. On Wednesday, we heard from the Santa Fe County Sheriff and the District Attorney there about updates in the shooting incident involving actor Alec Baldwin. Last week, cinematographer Helena Hutchins, we know, was fatally shot by Baldwin on the set of the movie Rust. Assistant director Dave Halls grabbed one of the three prop guns on the set and handed it to Baldwin, yelling, quote, cold gun to indicate it didn't contain any live rounds. But it was lead armorer Hannah Gutierrez who had set up the guns for use that day. The 24-year-old is the daughter of well-known Hollywood armorer Thel Reed and was still relatively new to that position and had even expressed some concerns over taking the lead armorer position on an earlier film starring Nicolas Cage. Now, in the press conference Wednesday, authorities revealed some new details about the guns that were used on the set. Through the execution of search warrants, we have collected about 600 items of evidence. These include, but are not limited to, three firearms, approximately 500 rounds of ammunition, and several pieces of clothing and accessories. We believe that we have in our possession the firearm that was fired by Mr. Baldwin. This is the, this is the firearm we believe discharged the bullet. We also believe that we have the spent shell casing from the bullet that was fired from the gun. The actual lead projectile that was fired has been recovered from the shoulder of Mr. Souza. The projectile was recovered by medical personnel where he was being treated and turned over to the sheriff's office as evidence. We regard this specific spent casing and recovered projectile to be the live round that was fired from the revolver by Mr. Baldwin. I will talk in reference to the caliber of the actual weapon that was fired by Mr. Baldwin. That, uh, that firearm was an uh, F. Lee Pieta Long Colt 45 revolver. There, there were other, there was other ammunition in the gun that we believe uh, was fired by Mr. Uh, and were there, were there other live bullets in any of the other guns that you recovered? I think that's an important point. Any other live bullets in any of the other guns, including the one that you recovered from Alec Baldwin? As of right now, there were three firearms that were located on uh, the set within uh, close proximity to the uh, to the incident. Um, we're still going to determine, we'll send the, the firearm that was fired by Mr. Baldwin to the crime lab and do a functionality test. Obviously, it did fire a live round. Um, the other weapon is uh, a, a single-action Army 45 revolver. That one looks like there's some modification to the cylinder. It may not be functioning, but that won't, that'll be determined by the crime lab. The other firearm is a plastic, non-functioning revolver. So you said that a live round was recovered. Based on the witness interviews that you've done, can you tell us what you've learned about how live uh, ammunition was on the set uh, and how it made its way into that firearm? We learned that there was possible target practice maybe earlier that day. What have you learned on that front? So I think what we've learned is, is we suspect that there was other live rounds that were found on the set. I won't comment further on how they got there. That's still part of a, a this, this investigation is active, so I won't comment on how they got there. But we know, we suspect that they are there. That will be up, it will be determined when, when uh, testing is done by the crime lab in reference to whether or not they are officially live rounds or not. We want to welcome in a very special guest joining us this afternoon here on Court TV Live, Dutch Merrick. He is a prop master, also an armorer, and the former president of the union IATSE Local 44. And in addition to his film and TV work, he's also worked on over 500 commercials as a prop master or art director. Welcome back to the program, Dutch. Great to have you again with us. If I may, I want to begin by asking you about that press conference yesterday. I know that you were watching along live as it was happening in Santa Fe, New Mexico. First question, what was the biggest thing that jumped out at you? Well, I, I took copious notes and it, it raised a lot of questions. And people are questioning things that are actually pretty mundane. Uh, people have reported things like the ammunition was in a fanny pack which is a pretty common practice uh, so that an armorer can carry the ammo to the set, the, uh, the blank rounds, and they can reload the actor right next to where they're standing. So something like that really isn't as relevant or the number of 500 rounds people have been hitting. It, not 
not unusual on a feature film that's literally going to go through hundreds and hundreds of rounds. So that's that's not anything to focus on. Uh, there was a quote uh, I wrote down from the sheriffs. He talked about three types of gun, which is, again, pretty common. There was the one what we call a hero prop or the hero gun, which is a fully functioning gun. And one he said was modified. I'm guessing that was a replica or something made not to shoot. And then the other one would be a rubber or a plastic one, which would often be the stand-in. Um, they reported that the first AD had counted three rounds. And this statement to me was a little out of context that he had inspected the gun uh, and found three cartridges. But And then the quote was that the armor didn't spin the cylinder all the way around, which I don't, I can't make heads or tails of that out of context because if, if the AD was going to hand the gun to the actor for a rehearsal, it would be empty and not have any cartridges in it. So I'm trying to figure out the context of when that statement was made. Um, the And it seems that the it's important to note that the armorer was hired as a dual role, an armorer and a prop assistant. Uh, I talked to a fellow that was a prop master lined up to work on that show. He turned it down because it looked like it was a in his opinion, a train wreck ready to happen. He put in a bid to have five people in his prop department and an armorer. And the producers sent back a note saying that we'll give you two assistants. And one of those assistants has to double as the armorer. And it's clear that that's how this show ended up crude was with one prop master and two assistants. And this young armorer was with a dual role as a prop assistant, where on one hand, she's dealing with small items and wristwatches and you know, a glass of water over here, and then she's also got a safety of the firearms over there. And that uh, divided attention, especially for someone as new as she was, uh, is is a real problem. None of this sounds good, Dutch. I wonder if that also goes to something the sheriff said that jumped out at me, how he said, seems to me there was some complacency on this set. Would you agree with that? Yeah, the, you know, as the facts come out and this story really starts to flesh itself out, the personalities involved, the first AD, I, I've worked with people that that <laughs> seem like him in that sort of rush, 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 run, run, run mentality. And the young armorer, uh, a young gal from the previous interview she had on the Nicolas Cage film, she sounded like she had been maybe a little overwhelmed, and now she's in a dual role as a prop assistant and an armorer, and here's an AD who's probably overbearing, and on a day like that day, when a bunch of the crew walked off and left the show and were escorted out by security, and there's a stand down, basically she can't film when there's no camera crew, they're waiting to get a new camera crew in, so I imagine it was a chaotic atmosphere, and, and a absolute recipe for disaster. And and again, this first AD never should have been handling the firearm, in my opinion. Uh, all reports are that he handed the gun to Alec Baldwin. Uh, the sheriff reported in this press conference that, quote, two people handled the gun. And again, that was out of context because does that mean that the armorer prepared the revolver, handed it to the AD, AD handed it to the actor? Pardon me. Right, Dutch. I, I, I'm with you there that this is very hard to follow, especially, um, you know, in, in light of the fact that in addition to the press conference, there was also a, a search warrant affidavit of probable cause that was uh, disseminated, uh, made public, and, and we got our hands on it. And I know you're referencing some of this now. And it doesn't make a lot of sense. I see that it says in, in this affidavit that Dave Halls took one of those guns from that, that prop cart, handed it to Baldwin. Um, and he said that the armor sometimes handed the gun to Baldwin, sometimes to Halls. And when I read that, I thought of what you were teaching us earlier this week when you came on the program, how you were saying the first assistant director never, ever is handling the prop guns. That is the job of the armor. They have more of an overarching safety position. Did that jump out at you as well when you read this affidavit? Oh, in a big way, in a big way. The the first assistant director, in my opinion, is like the conductor of an orchestra. And that first assistant director points over to the bassoon and says, it's your turn. And then they point over to the drums and it says, it's your turn and bring in the violins. They don't play any of the instruments. They don't touch them. 
Uh, a first assistant director's tools of the trade are a walkie-talkie to communicate, a call sheet to follow a map for the day, and a Sharpie to change it. That's it. And you point. And when the armorer says a gun is cold, the first AD repeats it, the language of the armorer. Or any safety person, when a special effects person or a stunt coordinator says we're ready, then the first AD repeats their words. Uh, this, the thought that the first AD was ever, and especially not regularly, handing the gun to the actor, um, it's hard for me to imagine that rhythm. Although I have worked with first ADs who are so overwhelmed with trying to uh, stay on schedule or keeping up appearances of staying on schedule, that they'll move a light or push a camera or move anything out of the way, just go, go, go. And I think that is one of the weak links here. Most certainly. Dutch, I also read in the affidavit that there were uh, there was ammunition and, and we don't um, know what type, obviously, because it hasn't been tested yet. We know it's all going to the FBI's crime lab, but ammunition left unsecured on that prop cart. Uh, how bad so, is that in terms of a deviation of safety protocol? It's it's fairly common because, you know, the fast pace with which we do film you keep your equipment at the ready. So with the armorer standing at the ready with their cart, uh, particularly a full-time armorer, not someone divided by doing props and guns, they can be in attendance and you keep your, your blanks at the ready. In the case of, you know, in like an action film, we're loading semi-automatic magazines all day long. We've got machine gun fire and there's police with their, uh, you know, magazine fed automatics. So we're constantly sort of reloading these magazines and you keep a box of those. And when you reset, you go grab a couple magazines, put them in the guns for the fellows, and then you bring them back. In the case of an old Western like this, the rounds are generally in a box or loose and you're dumping them out of the revolver one at a time. And then you reach in your pouch or to your cart and you put them in one at a time. So it's common to have them out. Um, when they say they're sending them to the FBI for testing, uh, Honestly, when you look at a dummy round and a blank and a real bullet, it's very obvious to the armorer and most people would be able to tell immediately. So I don't know that they need lab testing to determine what types of rounds they are. Certainly, I imagine who touched them or maybe when they were fired. I'm curious, the first AD reported that he counted three rounds in the gun, three casings, but he didn't, he wasn't sure if the armor had spun the cylinder, he said. and. So I'm, I'm really trying to wrap my head around that language. Was there three casings in the gun? Does that mean there was two fired and one real bullet? Were there two blanks in a bullet? Were there two dummy rounds in a bullet? And he didn't look at all of them. Uh, why would you rehearse with a gun with dummies in it anyway? And again, when you think about this prop cart, the, the ar armor's cart, it's very common for us to have a real gun, a replica, and a rubber. And the rubber is for stunts, so it can be dropped on the ground. The replica is for using all the time. Just everyone knows it's safe. It can't do anything. It's inert. And then the reel is one you put in when you do actual gunfire. Now, when they're going to do a blocking rehearsal like this, the armor would generally hand the rubber or the replica because it's not on camera. It's not during a take. So you can use anything. You don't need to use the real gun. So did the first AD look at the cart and not know the difference between a replica and a real gun and grab the real one? Or did they decide, let's just always use the real one for rehearsals and there's there's brass in it? Um, it's on a revolver like that, there's a gap between the cylinder. If need be, I have a photo I can demonstrate, but there's a gap between the cylinder and the frame and from the side of the gun, you can easily see where the shiny brass of a casing is. So it's pretty obvious that there's something in the gun or there's nothing in the gun. Right, I remember you telling us that the other day when you were on the program, Dutch, and I kept thinking, the one thing really jumped up, many things jumped up, but the one that really horrified me was when the sheriff said that other ammunition was in that gun as well. So it's your point about not everything needs to be tested. I would say those, uh, you know, probably should be and will be, I'm sure without a doubt they will be. 
I, I have so many more questions for you, and you're kind enough to stay with us, give us some more of your time and expertise. Dutch Merrick, thank you so much. You're going to stay with us after this break. We're also going to be bringing in uh, for our next segment uh, someone who is really an expert on uh, the laws in New Mexico. Uh, she is a professor of law, uh, practices criminal defense work, everything from minor misdemeanors to death penalty cases, and has served as a prosecutor. Cynthia Armijo will be here next, and we're going to do some legal analysis on who might be facing charges. Welcome back to Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice. I'm Julie Grant. We know last week actor Alec Baldwin fatally shot cinematographer Helena Hutchins on the set of the Western film Rust, a tragedy that left many people not familiar with guns, trying to understand the various nuances and mechanics of firearms. But what about the legal aspects of the incident? The Santa Fe County Sheriff and District Attorney spoke to reporters Wednesday about where things stand in the investigation. <laughs> President for a case like this in Santa Fe County, where you have somebody who fired a gun, did it, it was clearly accidental, he, was, he thought it was a cold gun, but other people loaded that gun, where it's kind of not the person who actually fired it, but could be held liable. Is there any kind of precedent for a case like this in your county? No. <laughs> no, there's no precedent. Factor whatsoever. into your investigation. I mean, this is very, it's a tricky legal battle. Uh, it, it is a very complex case. Um, it will require lots of legal uh, research and analysis and review. That's what my team is here for, and that's that's how we're assisting the sheriffs at this point. Um, that said, again, we don't know how that's going to play in until we get that, that complete investigation. How much will you take into account the previous accusations of unset, unsafe practices and negligence on other sets? We know you go to this set, but there are reports coming out from Hannah and David of negligence and unsafe practices on other sets. How much will you take that into account? Well, that's up to the district attorney to determine how much that's going to weigh, but we are going to follow up on some of those statements that are made. Um, that there were other incidents. Uh, we definitely want to speak to anybody uh, that has any information in reference to safety issues on further sets or whether uh, there were uh, other issues. And we would encourage them to call the sheriff's office at 505-986-2490 with any information they may have um, so we can get a, a, a good idea of what the totality of the circumstances are on this set and what's happening in the industry. Sheriff, sure. 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 can you follow up on that with other previous movie productions? And that is something that will play into our legal analysis when we get the completed investigation from the Sheriff's Department. It obviously could play into whether charges get filed or not. Sheriff, as the man who pulled the trigger and as a producer on the movie, does Alex Baldwin himself face the potential of criminal charges? And if the DA could perhaps follow up with that as well. That may be a, a, a question better answered by the district attorney. Um, all options are on the table at this point. I'm not, take, I'm not commenting on charges, whether they will be filed or not, or on whom. So... The answer is we, we cannot answer that question yet until we complete a more thorough But there is the potential for Alec Baldwin himself to face charges because you have not ruled them out. No one has been ruled out at this point. Now, in an interview with CNN, District Attorney Mary Carmack always shares what they're looking for to determine whether or not any charges will be filed. It's certainly something that we explore and will be part of the investigation. Um, we, we will actively be looking for that and then and then we're actively soliciting people if they know something to please come forward contact the sheriff's department be interviewed bring documents or paperwork that they may have so that we can take that into account in our investigation i was sort of taught was you treat a firearm like a live snake mm -hmm. and um and so it's it's a terrible tragedy. We don't know how those live rounds got there. And I think that that will probably end up being kind of the linchpin um, for whether a decision is made about charges. Still with us, prop master and armor Dutch Merrick. And we want to welcome into the conversation criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor and law professor Cynthia Armijo, joining us from Santa Fe, New Mexico. It is really, really great to have you both. You're, you're teaching us so much. Uh, Cynthia, you were also on the program yesterday when that press conference was happening. And you've been assessing this case really from the outset. So I want to start there with you. Give us your assessment as somebody who knows the laws in the state of New Mexico. 
So initially, what we need to look at is involuntary manslaughter. Um, basically, what that requires is that somebody acted without due caution and circumspection. And it's a negligent standard, meaning would a reasonable person have done the same in the same or similar circumstances? Now, somebody had asked about case law in New Mexico. Uh, we are actually very limited with case law on that, um, especially dealing with uh, uh, crops and that type of situation. So um, it is going to be an interesting analysis. Uh, the DA may go to other jurisdictions and see if that has come up somewhere else and possibly use that to analyze the case. But at this point, it looks like they're going to proceed under involuntary neg or involuntary manslaughter standard. Mm -hmm. Right. Dutch, where you and I left off a few minutes ago before the break, we were talking about how the sheriff said there was other ammunition in that gun that Alec Baldwin fired. Uh, and we know that there, there were live rounds that somehow made their way onto this set. Uh, what did you think when you heard that in the press conference yesterday? Well, I was really, I mean, we suspected there was a, 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 a live round that got onto the set, uh, but I'm still in shock that anybody would have the sense to bring a real bullet onto a movie set. Uh, you know, we do it day in and day out, and nobody on a film set here in L.A. or New York uh, or probably any of the major film hubs would ever think twice about bringing a real bullet onto a film set. You know, we create, there's a friend of mine who works in theater and he said he was taught one of his first uh, jobs that they treat the actors, they're like a four year old and they just play fully. And so we need to safety that environment for a four year old. You know, you cover the outlets and you just, you make everything safe so that they can completely do what they need to do. And so that means don't have live rounds there. Um, can I point out the, the press conference? They said, uh, they talked about the history of, of the, some of the people involved in past practices. And I think it's come out and it's important to note that both the first AD and the armorer, who are the people in this sort of food chain that migrated the gun to Alec Baldwin, the first AD has now a known history of having a temper and having safety problems on his set. Uh, I believe I heard something about misfires or accidental discharges on his set uh, and being uh, difficult to get along with. And uh, I've had people reach out to me and a friend of mine's an art director. He says, oh yeah, I worked with that first AD and he was so bad, I forced him to apologize for being so abusive to our prop master. Now this armorer, it's come out that on her last show, the Nicolas Cage film, uh, there was a couple of accidental discharges, uh, or she fired a gun without calling it out, and Nicolas Cage was so rattled that he yelled back at her and told her to, you know, cut it out, in, not in that language. So you've got two people that both have a, a, a recent history, probably he has a longer history, of just elements that might lead up to this type of situation, and that was, that's, a, that's a bad combination, those two. That's a bad recipe. Certainly is Dutch. I'm glad you mentioned that because Cynthia, let me bring you in on this, please. How does knowing these instances happened in the past with these two individuals factor into the prosecutors and, and the sheriff's office deputies analyzing what these individuals may or may not have done under the proper standards? And you just told us about negligence here. How might what occurred in the past help establish criminal intent with any negligence here in this case. So what's interesting about the criminal law is you need to establish a few things. And the first is mens rea and actus reus. So the actus reus is the actual shooting itself, but the mens rea is what the intent of the parties were at the time. So in this case, the more information that is known about what Eric ba or Alec Baldwin knew um, is going to be important in his prosecution to establish the mens rea or the criminal intent in this case. Um, certainly the prior history of uh, the armorer as well as the um, assistant director are going to be relevant too, um, whether they were already told that that is something that you do not do. And I certainly think that the uh, they will probably use experts um, to provide that information to the jury in an analysis of whether or not they were negligent.
This is really helpful, Cynthia. And, and just kind of a follow-up, I want to hone in on each of these individuals um, one by one, starting with Alec Baldwin. Uh, Cynthia, in your view, what, if any, criminal responsibility might he have here? Well, he has an interesting case because he has liability not only as the shooter who committed the actus reus or the criminal act itself, he also has liability as the producer of the film. Um, and what, the fact that he did hire people that he could have known that maybe weren't up to par, um, but still hired them anyway. Um, another thing that's going to be an issue is the fact that they were having some issues prior uh, during this set with um, guns going off or um, things that weren't planned for. So he knew that there was an issue with it. So that's going to be important for him as well. Certainly. Before we get to the other two, the first assistant director and the armorer, Dutch, let me ask you about something that's been reported in the media, and, and there were some questions raised about it during the press conference, and that was target practice going on, that there are some allegations that some crew members were using um, perhaps that gun, we don't know yet, for target practice during breaks in the shooting of the film. What did you think when you heard that, please? Well, First of all, it's unheard of. Uh, target practice with real ammunition on a real film set is, is it boggles the mind. It's hard for me to grasp who would have thought that was a reasonable and responsible activity on the job. I try to put myself on that set, you know, and try to envision what it was like that day, that morning. And here's a crew that's gone three weeks without pay. They've been working 14 hour days. The union had been out there negotiating with the producers to work shorter days. Uh, they had asked for hotel rooms to stay locally because most of them lived in Albuquerque an hour away. Uh, they were given an inadequate op uh, option for housing. Um, it sounds like the, the set itself was a mess. And I know that they understaffed it just from the example of the prop department. So there's the camera department walking off in the morning, packing their tools and everything comes to a stop. While the producer, not likely Alec, but the UPM or the line producer, madly falling around trying to find a replacement camera crew for that day. So I imagine the rest of the crew sitting idle after uh, working in miserable circumstances for a few weeks. And uh, who knows, someone brought a box of ammo uh, and then decided to burn off some steam or, hey, let's have some fun while we're waiting for a new camera crew. It, it's which either case, I can't imagine that happening. And so was this a leftover round for some recreational plinking next to the set? Or was it a round that was uh, casually put into the gun as a ha-ha-ha moment? Uh, I don't know. This is really, really bizarre. Mm -hmm. Or intentionally put there. Something more sinister could be happening here, as, as we all know. Who knows? Uh, but that's really fascinating insight from you, Dutch, that you're sharing with us. And it, it's truly appalling. If somebody wants to go to the range, go on their own time. Uh, don't bring it to, to a movie uh, production set. Uh, Cynthia, uh, before we're out of time, I want to get to the first assistant director in the armor. What, if any, criminal liability do you see with these two individuals and why? I certainly see involuntary manslaughter um, for both of them. Um, it, I think it's going to be important to know what the protocol is typically in these type of cases. And if they didn't follow protocol, then they could also be charged with involuntary manslaughter. Yeah, this is, is really just the tip of the iceberg. I think, I think a lot more is going to come out uh, as the investigation progresses. Uh, we are so grateful to have you both on the program. Cynthia Armijo and Dutch Merrick, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and expertise. And we hope to have you back on the program again soon.